study. It's good to see you all this evening again. Uh, I want to start by uh, welcoming a new friend uh, here to our church. Um, just want to say hello to Janet. Uh, believe it or not, she is watching us from Scotland. So, Janet, how are you? Uh, love to have you join us someday. Hope to meet you in person. Uh, Facebook is cool, but real life is much better. So, uh, but we're glad that you're joining us, and she's been joining us the last couple of weeks. So, hey, how about if everyone just says, "Hey, Janet"? Hey, Janet. Hi. <laughs> well. Uh, We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 20 this evening, and I'd like for you to grab your Bible, please, and put your eyes on God's Word. Uh, The Scriptures are clear that as each person does their own special work, it helps the others to grow, and um, I've been praying that this week and then today, again, that 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 would be the case. I'm privileged and and honored to have uh, a church to, to preach God's Word, the gift to to teach God's word to folks. And so I'm praying that as I exercise the gift that God has given me, that it will help you grow into the uh, image of Jesus Christ. And so uh, that is my desire uh, this evening. I hope it's yours as well. Um, We've been studying through the gospel of Luke uh, over a year now, and we want to, uh, we've been studying it because we want to worship Jesus well. We want to worship Jesus correctly, accurately. And the only way we can do that is if we know who he is. And we don't care about what grandma told us necessarily. And I don't really necessarily care what any preacher may have told you or told me. It's all that matters is what's in God's word. And so we've been studying through the gospel of Luke to find out exactly what Jesus said and what he did and what he taught and what he didn't say and what he didn't teach so that we could worship him in spirit and in truth. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, This week's no exception. Um, A little bit different in that it's not necessarily something that Jesus taught, although every time he opened his mouth he was teaching something. Uh, But what I found in the text here tonight in uh, Luke 20, verses 20 through 26, that'll be our dinner. Uh, I hope you're hungry. And um, what you're going to see here is you're going to see awesome jump-off points to explore the nature and character of God, to dispel some myths about Jesus, and to explore the truth of who he really is. And then it'll also help us to properly respond to him, okay? And so that's where we are tonight. So the question is, is should I follow him? Because that's what he said. He said, come follow me, right? And so that's the question. Should we follow this Jesus? And I see, I think in this text, uh, the decision as to whether you should follow him or not will be clear. So let's read that. Are you there? Does Jesus have your full attention? Are your eyes on the word? All right, awesome. Watching for their opportunity, the leaders sent spies pretending to be honest men. They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would arrest Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. Well, that'll preach right there all night long. Just that one thing. He don't care what anyone else says or what they think. That's for you. That was free. Teacher, they said, you... We know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their trickery and said, show me a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on this coin? Well, Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So they failed to trap him, say duh. So they failed to trap him by what he said in front of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer and they became silent. Okay, so the question that I I pose tonight is, should you follow Jesus? It's a very, very important question. As a matter of fact, it's the only question that really matters. Um, A million years from now, you're not gonna think about any other question except that one. 
Did I follow Jesus? Should I have followed Jesus? And so we need to pursue that tonight. That being said, let me ask you a question, and you probably know, are you familiar with the uh, Latin system of, of grading like honors? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like when you're super, super smart, your like, um, greatest honor is, is magna cum laude. Have you ever heard of this? Someone graduates with that and they've got the straps on, you know, the little, the little uh, ropes and stuff on their gown. You've heard of this? So if, like great honor, like if you get really good grades, like super, super duper good grades, you're magna cum laude. If, if you're the highest of honors, like I'm talking like the best in the class, like the highest level of grades. Like you get all A's and, you're, and you got, and, and in, the, in a class, there's usually two or three of them, you know, that are the best. The best of the best, right? Summa cum laude. Now there's another term that's not very common. I didn't even know about it until I started digging into it this week. There's actually another term. It's, very, it's, it's not used very frequently because not too many people get there. If, if there's a group of two or three, or, or even two, in, in the class that are summa cum laude, the, the highest of honors, but there's one, let's say there's one that has all A's like the other one, but they were all in honors classes. And then on top of that, they had some extracurricular activities. Maybe they're involved in student government or sports or whatever, and, and, they, and they achieved high success in those things too, agresia cum laude. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's exceptional and singular in highest honors. And the question tonight is, should I follow Jesus? Is he worthy of being followed? It's a good question. So what we see in this text, though, is what often is the case. These people aren't following Jesus. As a matter of fact, they tried to pull a fast one on him. They tried to trick him. They tried to outsmart Jesus. They tried to get Jesus to say something so he could be arrested, to trap him, to, to back him into a corner to say something. They thought that they had greater wisdom than the simple carpenter's kid from Nazareth. But the problem was, was this. Here's the problem with their plan. They thought they could outsmart Jesus. They had greater wisdom than he they were being sneaky. But the problem is this. Psalm 33, 6 says that the Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. That he breathed the word and all the stars were born. For when he spoke, verse 9 says, the world began. It appeared at his command. But who is this Lord that is spoken of in Psalm 33? Well, Colossians 3, 16 brings clarity to it. It says that this Lord was Jesus and that everything was created by him and for him. So here's some news for you and news for those that would try to outsmart Jesus, who would try to trick him. Proverbs 8, 22, I, wisdom. This is wisdom speaking. I, wisdom, was with the Lord when he began his work. Long before he made anything else. I was born before there were oceans or springs overflowing with water. Before the hills were there. Before the mountains were put in place. God had not made the earth or fields. Not even the first dust of the earth. I was there when God put the skies in place. When he stretched the horizon over the oceans. When he made the clouds above and put the deep underground springs in place. I was there when he ordered the sea not to go beyond the borders he had set. I was there when he laid the earth's foundation. I was like a child by his side. I was delighted every day, enjoying his presence all the time, enjoying the whole world and delighted with all its people. I skipped a verse on purpose. And you guys all noticed that because you're reading your Bibles, right? I skipped verse 23. It's the most important part of the whole passage. Jesus is, it says that the Lord spoke and everything was created. Jesus created everything for him, by him. Verse 23 of Proverbs 8, wisdom says, I was created in the very beginning, even before the world began. The first thing that Jesus Christ ever created was wisdom itself. And these people were trying to outsmart 
the creator of wisdom. <laughs> Scripture would also teach us in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Jesus, although creator of wisdom, would become wisdom itself for our benefit. So that we could know wisdom, so we could gain wisdom Jesus became wisdom for us. In other words, the full manifestation of wisdom is found in the person of Jesus Christ the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.24 would also go further and say that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. I love this. This is an awesome one. Colossians 2.3 says this. In him, you can almost see Paul going like this. Like, he says, in him, lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Like, you don't have to guess where wisdom is. It's not like there's a treasure map with no X. He gives you the treasure map right there, and he's like, listen, all wisdom is right here. It's right here. Can you see the invitation? When I read that, I could see Paul going like this to me. Come, come meet Jesus. Come explore all wisdom. He's right here. Come and see. But instead of exploring the depths of wisdom's creator and wisdom itself, they tried to outsmart the creator of smart. It's kind of dumb. Kind of convicting. They tried to outsmart the creator of smart. They tried to trick the egregia cum laude of transcendent intelligence. And don't you do that? And don't I do that? And don't we all do that? I mean, are we, uh, what are we doing? Are we, ex are we exploring the depths of wisdom that are available in Christ? Are we going after him with our whole heart, pursuing him with everything that we are? Are we, are we, are we, are we exploring him or are we excusing him? I mean, all the wisdom, all, the treasure of all wisdom is found in Jesus. So here's the gold mine of the universe and it's been presented to you and you know that it's there. Are you going after that greatest of all treasures? I don't know. I know I'm not the way I should. Instead, I rationalize my sin and I disregard and excuse my disobedience. I say we're all lax in our exploring of real wisdom. Are you exploring him or are you excusing him? Just think about it for a second. Like, I think it's worth a pause to evaluate your own life. Even those of us that, are, that come to church every week, come to Monday night prayer group, come to Wednesday night Bible study, go to the mall and, and, and discuss the message more. Just think of the, even those of us that I study a lot. I spend time in prayer and in, in the word a lot, maybe more than most. But if you think about it for a second, if, if all the treasures of wisdom are found in here, if this was the greatest treasure of wisdom in all of the universe, what would you do to get after it? Are you getting after it? I don't know. I, I, I would think you would, right? If there was a million dollars in this church somewhere right now and I said it's free to whoever gets it how many people would be in their seat for more than another second and a half right true and God his wisdom is far greater than that here's another thing that you'll see here how we treat Jesus look at look back at the text look at who these people remember um Remember I said a couple weeks ago about the veneer of religion? How Jesus just can't stand that. The ones who are fake and phony, he called them whitewashed tombs, right? You look good on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. You know, the whitewash is just is water with some paint in it because it's cheap and quick and it does the job. But the problem is, is after you paint it, not even a year goes by and the fence has to be painted again because eventually, quickly, the paint fades because it's got mostly water and it's not a whole lot of pigment. And, and what happens is it fades and what's underneath is exposed. And look here in the text. You see, the, look at them. The, the people, they come up to him and they're like, teacher, is that accurate? Is he? Is he? He's a teacher, right? Yeah. 
Um, we know that you speak and teach what is right. Is that true? Yes, yes absolutely. And are, and are not influenced by what others think. Is that true? Yes. Absolutely. How about this? You teach the way of God truthfully, right? Awesome. But what does it say? I saw through that trickery. I saw through the trickery. It was true, but it was meaningless. That's the whitewashed tomb. You can't trick the creator of intelligence. You can't trick the creator of wisdom. He sees through all that junk that we bring to him that's fake and phony. As a matter of fact, he goes the, the opposite is true, that the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth searching for, to strengthen those whose hearts are completely his. He, he wants to strengthen and bless the ones who are, who are honest and authentic about what they're bringing to the Lord, but the ones who are fake, he's like, yeah, whatever. Keep it, man. I don't want it. He saw through their trickery. These guys thought that they were smarter than Jesus. That's pretty funny. They, they had a really dark heart in this matter. You think about what they were doing. They, they figured this. If, if we can get him to, to say that, um, well, don't pay your taxes. See, he was supposed to be the revolutionary, right? They would start this new thing and free them from Rome, and, and he'd be their new king, and, and they'd be free from this uh, nasty, murderous, oppressive uh, regime, right? And so, so, so if he says, yeah, don't, don't pay your taxes. We're going to start a new thing. I'm the new king now. Well, that'd be perfect because then they could have him arrested and then killed. But at the same time, if he said, well, well no, don't, don't pay your taxes, I'll, get arrested. But if he says, yes, pay your taxes, well, then all the Jewish people that had hope and faith in him, they'd think he was a traitor, right? See, they, they, they were oppressing the people of, of, of Israel, and so um, they, they don't want to pay taxes to the nasty the oppressors, right? They don't want to pay taxes. So, so Jesus should tell them, no, don't pay taxes to the bad guys, well, but if he says don't pay taxes, he'll get arrested. If he says pay taxes, you're a traitor to your own people, right? This is what they thought they could do. Did you guys ever play chess when you were little? Who played chess? Who, who still plays chess? Anybody? A couple people? Yeah, I played chess. I had a chess game when I was little, and uh, I'm not really good at it, to be honest with you. Um, it's kind of a game for intellectual people, so I'm not really that good at it. But it's a fun game, but you know, uh, if you play chess, you'll know what I'm talking about, but if you don't play chess, which is the majority of the room, when you, when the whole idea is, you know, you gotta get the other guy's king. And, and, and if you find your way to that side of the board close to their king, and you have a move that's gonna get the king, that's check. If you surround the king, so that no matter where the king goes, you got him, that's checkmate. That's checkmate. And these people thought they had checkmate on Jesus because they thought they were smart, right? They thought they had checkmate. Remember a couple weeks ago, I reminded you of Hebrews 4.12 where it says, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. Watch as the creator of wisdom itself, the word of God, watch how he performs surgery right here. Show me a Roman coin in response. Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Yeah. Drops the mic. <laughs> See ya. Like, what are they going to do there, right? <laughs> Checkmate, huh? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. See, Rome gets what's due them. And God gets what's due God. See, like, they didn't have any answer for this. That's why I said they were amazed. Like, we didn't see that one coming. Like, when you create everything, you can say whatever you want. And he did. And they didn't see it coming. It's one or the other. That's what they said. One or the other, man. You got you to pick your team. Pick it. One or the other. You either pay taxes or you don't. We all build these dichotomies, right? It's either this way or that way. We all have our own little world we've, we've created on our own. This is what we think. It's either this way or this way, my way or the highway. And the church is no different. We have all these false dichotomies. We think it's either, we're either Calvinist or Arminian. And I'm telling you, we're probably both. 
Some people say, well, you, we have church in the building. This is where we go to have church. And others are like, no, 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 you're supposed to have it in homes. Well, a careful study of the scriptures would tell you what? Both, right? There's no dichotomy here. It's not, it's both. Well, we dunk, well, we sprinkle. Let me tell you something, dunkers. There's gonna be sprinkled people in heaven with you. So you better get used to it. And I'm a dunker. But I guarantee you, you're going to see John Wesley, the Methodist, in heaven when you get there. Guaranteed. And so what is it supposed to be? Is it supposed to be dunk? Or is it supposed to be sprinkle? How about this? Get baptized. How about that? You could do that. Teach them to obey the commands of God. You got to do this. You got to do that. This is what the Bible says. If you love me, what? You keep my commands. No, 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 we don't talk about all that kind of command stuff. We teach grace. How about this? Both. Right? Keep his commands. But if you don't, there's some grace. Awesome. Did you see that Jewish right there? You saw that, didn't you? You saw that happen right there. Jumped out every once in a while, the Boston thing, and every once in a while, the Hebrew thing. It's just there. Oy vey. Oy vey is mea. So they see there was both right there. Did you see that? How about this one? This is an awesome one. Hey, it's either King James at your church or you're not even saved. Last time I checked, Jesus saves, not King James. Last time I checked, Jesus saves, and I'm a big fan of the book, right? You know I'm a big fan of the book. Um, this don't save you. Jesus saves you, right? Jesus saves you. Psalm 3, 8 says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah said in his book, chapter 2, verse 9, my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Ephesians 2, 8, God saved you by his grace it's a gift from God. See, we all put God in these enclosures, right, that, that he never really fits into. You see, you got to remember something. Your brain is about the size of Herb's coffee cup. And the known universe, the Bible says, are but the fringes of his robe, okay? So don't think that you could put him in some stable, that you're going to keep God in there. It's never going to happen, ever. Isaiah said, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Even as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You know Paul, who wrote the book of Romans? Did you ever read the book of Romans? The book of Romans is awesome. And in the beginning of the book of Romans, God uses the apostle Paul to outline uh, our sinful nature and how we're totally depraved and lost. And, and, and everyone has, has fallen short and, and everyone has gone a separate way and everyone is guilty before God and we're born with a sinful nature that won't honor God the way he wants to be honored and will not worship him the way he's to be worshiped and we all go our separate way and we're all sinners and we all fall short and, and, he, and he describes Jesus Christ coming and saving you and anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So he tells you how lost you are and how found you can be. And in Romans 11, he throws his hands up and goes, but who can understand the thoughts of God? So if, if the apostle Paul, who was sucked up to the third heaven and had direct revelation from Jesus, if he doesn't even understand, what makes you think you do? And why are we fighting about stuff? Doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> doesn't make any sense. So, start thinking like, why would Jesus say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's? Like, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't fall into my plan of who Jesus is and what I think he should do, right? They're, they're naughty. Rome is bad. Why would I give, why would he say that? Well, who can understand his thoughts, right? So, um, why would he say, give the bad guys this money? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, how, how about this? 
How about Romans 13 when it, when it tells us that everyone must submit to governing authorities? For all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. But Rome? But Rome? Mean, nasty, conquering, killing, oppressing, murdering, innocent Jesus, Rome? I started thinking about that. I started thinking about that. I started thinking, as I hope you do, when you read, you don't just read it and go, oh, that sounds good. I hope you think. I hope you meditate on God's word. Let it speak to you. <clears throat> I started thinking, well, like the good governments, the ones that are nice and kind and democratic and accept voting and maybe them, but... What about guys like that are in government that are bad? Like, I mean, because Hitler was in charge of the of a government, wasn't he? And Saad, Saddam Hussein was in charge of a government, isn't he? I started thinking about those things, and 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 um, this is a tough one. John six sixty says this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And and this is one of those. I started thinking about those nasty governments that do bad things to people. I was like, there's no way that God appointed them. You know, maybe that's where the free will comes in, right? And, 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 and God, you know, he appointed, um, you know, for all of our Republican friends, he appointed um, Ronald Reagan. Um, but again, the Republicans, they, they wouldn't say, well, most likely, it wouldn't say, well, they, he appointed Barack Obama. And of course, the Democrats would say, well, you know, Jimmy Carter was awesome and but there's no way that he appointed Donald Trump. I mean, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know that that stuff's going on in our minds. It's going on in my mind, too. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out how, how does this work, God? Because I've got, I want to put you in a stable, too. And, and I don't know the answer to these things in my flesh. I, I, I want to say that there's just no way Rome... <laughs> Rome. Well, here, here's the problem. Here's the thing that's hard to understand and accept. When we buy into enlightenment thinking where you think that you're in the center of everything and that human flourishing is the, is the apex of all universal things, then yeah, Rome is bad. It is. And when we're at the center of everything, then uh, Babylon was terrible as well. And when we're at the center of everything, Egypt is terrible as well. And when we're at the center of everything, drought and famine are terrible as well. But I love you too much to leave you hanging there, and I just wanted you to know the real true God. And to know the real tr true God, you need to understand that in his word, he tells us that he brings those terrible things. Everything I mentioned in that list of horrible, bad things was brought by God. And you may not like that, and I guess I don't like it either. And it might rub you the wrong way, but it's the truth. And that's the God that you're saying you believe in. And to say you believe in that God, you have to accept all that he is. You can't pick and choose the Bible buffet. This is in his word. When his people are not worshiping him and esteeming him as he would desire, he does some things. Sometimes, like in Romans, it said when they ignored him, he let them go. Hey, you want sin? Have it till you choke on it. But sometimes when they don't worship him the way he wants, he'll bring famine and drought to your land and he'll starve you to death and to get your attention, turn around. That's what he'll do. Don't put him in a fence. He's God and you're not, and nor am I. So yeah, Rome. Pay taxes to Rome. Think about this for a second. Rome was harsh and they were brutal killers. You know this of Rome, it's not a secret. They were murderers, they murdered. Anyone who got in their way, they would just kill them. 
and they wouldn't kill him nicely. Not like in our country now. They just give you a, a shot and you fall asleep. That's kind. Y'all know what they did to Jesus. They stripped him down. They slapped him. They spit on him. They insulted him verbally. They slapped him. They stuck him up on the cross naked for everybody to see. They whipped him to death. And then they spiked him and stuck a spear and killed him. That's not lethal injection, man. That's brutal murder of the innocent. But they also fulfilled the prophecy of the death of Messiah to make salvation available to the entire human race. So people dying, is that good or bad? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Let's see a vote. Come on. People dying, what is it? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Like Rome going through nations and just killing everybody. That's bad, isn't it? That's bad. Right? I hope you agree. But the, the Messiah dying, that's real good. That's hard, right? That's hard to accept. But, it, but, 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 but it, the scriptures say that it was God's good plan to crush him. So it's good. It's good. It's good. Nations conquered and oppressed. Very bad. Very bad. Very bad. But Christian, as a result of this, Christianity becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire so the gospel could spread in ways that they never ever conceived were possible before. Awesome. You see how even in this awful, awful, murderous regime, God was at work for him. Now, we may not like it. We may not like the trial or the situation he's putting you through either. But he does things for his namesake. And sometimes it hurts. Oftentimes it hurts. But it's for his glory. And that's what he does. So yes, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Because even in that, he's advancing his kingdom. And it's this truth that God is even sovereign over the nasty people, over the nasty, murderous nations that allows Jesus to say with confidence and authority, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Someone say amen. See, if other nations or religions actually transcended the power of Jesus Christ and they could stop him, well, certainly they would have by now. And, and us stubborn little Christians wouldn't keep multiplying, right? They would have stopped it by now. But, but, but here's the thing. It went from 12 people to over 2 billion. I think he's doing pretty good. I think he's making a case for his statement that it's true. I'm going to build my church. He's doing really, really good. And so if Christ and his missional church transcends all other things, then it makes sense to give to God what belongs to God. But the question is, what then belongs to God? you got to ask the question. What, what, let me ask you guys a question. What do you think? Give me some particulars, not big things, some particulars. What things belong to God? Just let me hear them. I meant little ones. <laughs> Your heart, a particular. Church, the earth. These are supposed to be little ones. You're stealing my, ch my thunder. Children, yes. Yes, your spouse. That's a good answer right there. That little person, who is that little person right there? She's cute. Hi, Briella. Oh, that's, okay, I couldn't see. Okay, awesome, that's your baby. Got another night off? You got time off, huh? Awesome. Free time belongs to the Lord. What else? Your sins, they do now, amen. That's a good answer. I love you, dude. The air you breathe. Whoa. Who? What? Your body. Those are big ones. You guys are supposed to do little ones, but how about this one? How about this? Psalm 24, 1. The earth. Is that you, Camille? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Psalm 89, 11. The heavens are yours. Psalm 50, verse 10. Every beast of the forest is mine, says the Lord. Haggai. You guys know there's a book in the Bible named Haggai? Haggai 2, 8. It says, uh, the silver is mine, and not even some of it. The silver. 
the silver is mine, and the gold, not just some gold, the gold is mine. All of these things, big things, they belong to the Lord. Except you can't bring those things. to. How many people can bring all the, the beasts of the forest to the Lord? That's not, you can't bring the heavens to the Lord. You can't bring the earth. You ain't that strong. You can't bring those things to the Lord. But what can you give him? So that's what really matters is what can you give him? We know what he owns, but what can you bring to the Lord? What can you give him? Well, let's turn the Bible pages. Come on now, Bible church. Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. There's a lot in that. You take a couple nights to unpack that one, but how about this? In there, he tells us the way that's the way to worship him. Like we all, remember earlier I said some of us go to Monday night and some of us go to Wednesday night and some of us go to the mall and some of us come here on, on Saturday and some of you come back on Sunday, double dipping, that's awesome. But, but, but so you have a way that you worship him. You, you, you eat certain foods, you pray a certain way, you sing certain songs, you give on the, in the baskets. There's certain things that you do. There's a way that you worship him, right? We all have our own way. You got your way, I got my way. Don't steal my way. But he says that there's a way. And it doesn't matter what your way is. His way is all that matters. He says that there's a way to worship him. And what is that? Give yourself completely. You gotta let that sink in for a second. At this church, maybe I'm guilty of getting a little bit too detailed and sometimes it hurts and maybe that's why the seats aren't as full as we'd like to see them i don't know but think about the particulars think about how he says you should give yourself completely that that's the way to worship him now compare that to the way you worship maybe some of the things i listed how you give how you pray when you pray how you serve do you share the gospel with people i mean just all the different things that could how, how do you worship him? Do you worship him like this? So we all want the blessings of God. Who wants the blessings of God? Anyone? Right? We all want the blessings of God. But this is how you get them. Can't circumvent the system, yo. This is the way it is, right? It'd be nice to have a cheat sheet, but there isn't one. It's just the way it is. Give yourself completely. I love how this says, he'll find it acceptable. Most translations say this is your reasonable worship. I've said this before. I'll say it again. He'll settle for all of you. He'll settle for everything you are all the time. He'll find that. He didn't even say he finds it great. <laughs> he says he'll find it acceptable. I'll take that. Right? Romans 6.13 says, give yourself completely to God. I, I love when scripture repeats itself, right? And that's because God's trying to make a point because you, we don't listen. So when Romans uh, 6 says, give yourself completely to God, isn't it the same thing as he repeats in Romans 12? Because I think God knows, like, one time's not going to get it. When I tell you to give yourself completely to me, you're going to start making excuses right away and rationalizing why you don't do this. So let me just reiterate what I was going to say. In case you didn't hear me, I'm saying I want all of you. Romans 6.13 goes on and says, Give yourself completely to God. You were dead, but now you have new life. Like, that's crazy, right? <coughs> He's not saying like a better, a better cameo. He's not saying a better herb. You're not a better, right? You're not a better Meredith. No, no, no. Actually, um, you were dead in your sin, but God gave you new life in Christ and forgave all your sins, Colossians 2, right? 
That, I mean, that, that, you were dead. <laughs> Flatline. You had no possibility of eternity with God. You had no possibility of being right with him. You were a dead man walking. And he gave you life. That's why it says, because, in Romans 12, 1, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. We gotta think about this for a second. Like, what has he done for me? Like, so I was thinking about that today. And this is a late addition to my message, but you know, I should want to do stuff for Meredith because I love her. Right? That's the only reason. I should want to do stuff for my wife because I love her. And that should be a singular motivation that should be sufficient to do things nice for her. It's just not. So I'm being honest in, in hopes that my transparency will help you to be transparent. It's not good enough. The truth is, is that when she's super, super good to me, it makes me want to bless her more. I mean, we can all, I think we can all be honest that when we, we all, if we, who has children? Okay. When they're super, super naughty, do you still love them? Raise your hand if you do. Of course. But, 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 when, yeah, but well, when they're super, super naughty, do you want to rush to the store and get them their newest gift that they want for Christmas? No. Nope. Of course not. So at least I'm not alone, if nothing else. We're all rotten. So I feel better at least. Even if there's no theology behind what I'm saying, at least I feel better. So thank you. <laughs> So when you think about how good the Lord has been to you if you're saved, right? Just think about that. You weren't just naughty child and now you're a good child and I get you a nice toy. You were dead and now you're alive because he died in your place. Bless you. Think about how good the Lord has been to you just in that. Think about what you brought to the cross. Did you ever think about that? What did you bring to the cross? I mean, I, lo I love, I mean, Meredith and I have been just bragging on you guys lately. This is the best time we've ever had in ministry, ever. It's the greatest season of our lives. It's just, you guys are amazing and, and you make it a joy to serve here. And I thank you. And you're amazing people, but just, i just be honest with you, like, you didn't bring crap to the cross, except death. Sin, death, ugly crap. That's what you brought. And you left that there, and you went home with life. You brought death to the cross, and he gave you life. Think about that when you Reflect on the goodness of God and whether you should give yourself completely to him. Think about your condition when you got to the cross. Think about what your future was without him and his intervention. Think about that the wages of your sin was death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. I don't know about you, but I never get tired of hearing that. It's the best news any human could ever hear. You were a slave to sin. You couldn't say no to it. You were a slave to its destiny for your life. You were gonna go to hell without him and he intervened and saved you. You were a slave. And as a dead person, could you rebel against that slavery? Is there anything you could do about it? Nothing. 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 And so Jesus freed you from your slavery. You know, back in the 1700s, 1800s, you know, way back in this country, we had a time where slavery was commonly practiced. It was an ugly, horrible time in our nation's history. You know this. You know this. There was a, a thing about slavery, though, that I wasn't, I guess I wasn't really aware of this, but as a slave, if somehow, which is really crazy, and I don't know how they could ever do it because they're a slave, but if you could somehow save up enough money, did you know that you could buy your freedom? You could go to your owner and you could actually give them money. And if it was enough money, they would set you free and give you papers so that nobody could buy you again. Now you're a free man. 
but it would cost money. And from what I've studied this week about that, and you know, it doesn't mean it's necessarily true, it's online, but from the different sources that I gathered, the average number for a, an adult male to be free, to buy their freedom, was $1,200. Like, that doesn't seem like a whole lot right now. If I was a slave, and you know, I don't have a whole lot of money, you know, so I didn't say I was broke. Did you notice that? We're, we're, we're working on that, aren't we? Who's broke in this room? Nobody. If you're a Christian, you ain't broke. You're a child of the king. Amen. You're rich, right? So, 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 so you could raise, I could raise 1,200 bucks if I needed to, if I was a slave. I'd find a way. <laughs> I'd find a way. It's not that much, but way back then, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, especially for someone who's not making any money. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big mountain to climb, right? But you could buy your freedom. And see, the Bible tells us that Jesus bought your freedom. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, it says that you are not your own, for you've, you have been purchased at a price. He bought you out of slavery. You were a slave to sin, death, and the grave, but he paid your 1,200 bucks, if you will. This, this amount of money that a slave, they couldn't, how could you raise money when you don't get paid? It was an insurmountable task, right? And so Jesus comes to your insurmountable task and he pays for your freedom. But he doesn't pay with $1,200. 1 Peter 1.9 says it was not paid with, I love this, with mere, M-E-R-E, mere gold or silver. Like, now to us, like a big old pile of gold would be nice, right? I'd be loving all that. And, and God, what does God even say about that? It's like, eh, it's nothing. He, he, didn't, he didn't pay with mere gold or silver, which loses its value. It was the precious blood of Christ that bought you, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. Now think about that for a second, right? Mere gold and silver. We, we hold that in high esteem in our country. Everybody wants to get their, their piece of the pie. Everyone's rushing out on the gold rush out to the west to go get their gold, to stake their claim, to have their pile of money, right? We put a lot of value in that. And he says here in the word of God that it's more than that. It's the precious blood of Jesus. And so we're talking about, should I serve him with my whole heart? Should I give him everything that I am? Well, you've got to consider how he paid you. It was his blood that paid your freedom. Listen, if you saved up enough money to go buy a brand new Mercedes Benz right now versus if you saved up 500 bucks to buy my Volvo, you can giggle. Just remember, with that $500, you get a nice red stain on your driveway from transmission fluid, so it's, it's a pretty good deal. Just throwing it out there. Doesn't go into reverse. My door handle on the driver's side is a zip tie, and I have no windshield wipers. I know, stop lusting after my car. I don't want to cause you to stumble, <laughs> right? But I made it here today, praise the Lord. Yeah, amen. There's probably a very nice puddle out there in the parking lot. I hope Home Depot doesn't get mad at me. But if you had spent all this money, all this resource on this Mercedes, Versus this, just a couple of bucks for this old rust bucket junker. Let's be honest. Who would you value more? Right? You take good, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like this thing is like, you don't park next to my car. <laughs> you park all the way down the end where no one can get it. And, Will you let the shopping cart away from my car? Don't park by my car. Whereas with my car, like I don't even care. People throw their kids on, they're standing on it. My kids climb on it. Who cares, right? It's a piece of junk. You gotta talk about the value of this blood that was spilled for your freedom. It's not just gold. We're trying to decide whether this, this Jesus should be followed. Should I give him everything that I am? Well, the biblical reality is that if you're truly a Christ follower, then Colossians 3, 4 says that Christ is your life. Christ isn't just a portion of your life. Christ is is your life. If you're not in him, you are a dead man or dead woman, destined for an eternity in hell. And so if Christ is your life, this is the biblical reality, then offering everything you are to him and to his service and to his mission isn't really optional. 
is it? It's not. You were bought at a price. This too is a very hard message to hear. Who can accept it? Well, did you know that Paul and Peter and James all called themselves slaves of Jesus? Willing to give everything that they were, every single resource that was in their hands and at their disposal to give, time, attention, money, your mouth, your hands, your life, everything to be a slave of Jesus. The reason why they said that is because he had bought them. And if you're a Christ follower in this room tonight, you are not your own. And this, this not showing up and not serving and not loving and not forgiving and not allowance for fault and not all, all these things that he says, listen, you are robbing from your master. That's true biblical teaching. It might not be warm and fuzzy and my teeth aren't sparkly and telling you that's your best life, but I'm telling you, we are stealing from our master when we don't give him everything we are because you're not your own. You've been purchased. I'd like to have the band come up and... Uh, Give us the opportunity, the precious opportunity to worship God in song. And as they're doing that, let me just ask you this. Like Christmas is coming, right? It's that one time a year where, where we're reminded of this new thing that God was doing, like bringing the baby Jesus, you know? Followed by New Year's, it's a new season, a, a new year's coming, we're going to make some New Year's resolutions, it's a new thing, Right? Well, how about it making some new priorities finally? Everything I am, God? That's what you want? Everything, God? All that I am, God? All that I have, God? You and your missional church before all else, God? Well, the Bible says that this is truly the way you're supposed to worship him. So I think that my challenge to you before we leave here is, is to start evaluating the way you're worshiping him. And I'm not here to rip you guys. Like, I love you. You're an awesome church, and you love Jesus. And, and, and I think that you do, a, you do a great job here, and you serve the Lord aggressively and passionately. But he said Everything. Will he, will he ever get everything from all of us? Probably not. But that's, that's the standard that he's setting for us, right? That's what he said. And so let, let's just do this. It's, it's, we're, we have this Christmas coming. We have a new year coming. Let's set some new priorities. Let, let's shoot for, for Lord, this, your word says that you want all of me everything that I am for your kingdom. That's what it says, right? So let's, let's shoot for that. Can we just shoot for that? Isn't, and isn't there grace when we stumble and fall? Of course. But, but, we, but we gotta be shooting for it, right? So let's just make that, let's just, let's just shoot for that. Let's, let's do this. When people come like to our Christmas Eve service and they meet you and they get to know you, that they actually see in you what we read in here. That's the only way they're going to... Nobody wants the unauthentic. Nobody wants fake. Nobody wants phony. No one wants the mask. We're whitewashed tombs. They see us when we're fake. And soon your whitewash is going to wash off. And they're going to see that, you, that it's not real. And they need to see the real thing. And so that's what I'm that's what I'm pushing you towards. I want to I want to push you in that direction and again I know that that might be why this church isn't as full as other churches cuz I'm I'm pushy. But listen, isn't the word of God super pushy? 
Is there anything in here that you read and go, oh yeah, that's awesome, I wanna do that, right? The whole book is filled with, I don't wanna do that. That's not what I want. I don't like the way that feels. The whole book, every page, every chapter, every book, the whole thing, all 66 of them are filled with stuff I don't wanna do and that I don't like. Am I alone? <laughs> the whole thing. So the, the world is looking for the authentic. So I'm gonna push and push and push and Jesus is gonna push and push and his word is gonna push and push and now that you've heard it, his Holy Spirit's gonna push and push and maybe he's gonna keep you up at night and my stupid mouth is gonna be ringing in your ears with the words of God that you heard tonight about giving yourself completely to him and I hope that you'll give in to it. If you wanna sleep, give in. <laughs> give in. He's relentless. And he'll pursue you. So if you wanna get some rest, Give in. All right? Let's pray, and then we're going to worship him together and with some good songs. You guys want to sing some songs? I love singing songs to Jesus. thinking, Lord, that uh, you're such the real thing. Like, <laughs> the things that you say in your Bible are just, they freak me out, man. They freak me out. Eat my body and blood, and you got to hate your parents compared to me. <laughs> That's just crazy stuff. Uh, I don't understand you often, Lord. But Lord, you know, I guess it's not really up to me to really understand it. Um, I guess that's your job to help me understand that. My job is to be obedient to it. Perhaps, Lord, in my obedience, you'll teach me to understand. It's a special night, God. It's convicting for me. I've seen a lot of things here tonight that I needed to see. I think you made it quite clear to all of us the health of your church as a whole, universally. Just like that video said, we're just way too comfortable. We're just way too comfortable. Heaven forgive us for our lax, our, our lax attitude and our complacency toward pursuing and exploring the depths of who you are, Jesus. Help us. I feel right now like Paul who says the things I want to do I don't and the things I don't want to do I do. Who can help me from this miserable life filled with sin and death but Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus I need you to help me too. As do we all. We're complacent Lord. The church in this country is complacent. We are complacent. I am complacent. I've let you down in that way. I know you love me the same, but I've let you down. And I don't want to do that anymore. Birth in us a passion for who you are. A passion like your passion to seek the kingdom's advancement. To seek and save that which is lost. To serve you with all of our heart and soul to seek out those that we could disciple, to teach them what you've taught us, to stop hoarding the truth and the treasure of Jesus to ourselves. 
to seek people out, much like you did as you walked down the beach. You sought people out and said, come follow me. Help us to seek people out and invite them to come follow you. Man, what a convicting night, Lord. Lord, forgive us of our failures. cleanse us that we, we might worship you now it's amazing as even in our failures your word says that you bring us into your presence holy blameless and without a single fault awesome thank you for this truth and it's from that truth Lord that we could stand, that we could lift our hands to you. We can open up our throats to you and sing to you. Please receive our worship tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.